Greetings students and welcome back to another video on special relativity. In this lesson we're going to discuss the relativity of velocity using the equations for the Lorentz transformations we derived in the previous video. So let's recall the Lorentz transformation equations. Suppose I have a reference frame R that I'll describe using the XYZ coordinate system with a time t. Suppose also that I have another reference frame R prime which I'll describe using this primed coordinate system with time t prime. Let's also say that this reference frame r prime is traveling at a velocity of v in the x direction relative to the reference frame r. At time zero, however, these reference frames line up perfectly. Now if there's some event f that occurs at some random time after time zero, and the space-time coordinates of f in the reference frame r are x, y, z, and t, while the space-time coordinates of f in the reference frame r prime are x prime, y prime, z prime, t prime, then the primed coordinates are related to the unprimed coordinates via the Lorentz transformation equations as follows, which I kind of went over in the previous video. So these Lorentz transformation equations allow us to relate the coordinates between two reference frames traveling at a constant velocity relative to each other. Note that gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where c is our speed of light. Now, in order to arrive at the equations for the relativity of velocity, we're going to need to add a wrinkle to this reference frame problem. Suppose that instead of a static event f that occurs at a fixed place in time, we'll have a dynamic particle p with coordinates x, y, z, and t in the reference frame r. In addition, instead of staying fixed in the reference frame r, this particle is actually moving with a velocity vector u. Now this velocity vector u has three components, a ux for the x direction, a uy for the y direction, and a uz for the z direction. Our goal is to find the primed components of the velocity of the particle p. In other words, the velocity components of p in the primed reference frame r prime. So in the reference frame r, Again, let me emphasize, in the reference frame r, not in r prime, the space-time location of my particle, x, y, z, and t, is given by the following. The x is just x0 plus ux times t, the y is y0 plus uy times t, and the z is z0 plus uz times t. And of course, the time t is just t. Time doesn't get translated or anything in the reference frame r just because the particle is moving. Note that x0, y0, and z0 represent the initial position of the particle p in the reference frame r. For our own convenience, we'll assume that the particle p started at 0, 0, 0, so the origin. When we do this, these equations above simplify to the following. We can make this assumption without loss of generality. I could set my origin to be the starting point of any particle. It doesn't matter as long as I take everything else into account using this origin uh, where I'm starting my particle at. Now, what we're going to do is take our coordinates of p and substitute them into the Lorentz transformation equations to get the primed coordinates of p in terms of the velocity components of that particle in the unprimed reference frame. Now, our goal is to find the primed velocities, the velocity components of the particle p in the primed reference frame. Since both reference frames are lined up perfectly at time zero, and since the clocks in both reference frames are perfectly synchronized at time zero, that just means the velocity of p in the primed reference frame is just the corresponding primed coordinate divided by the time elapsed in the primed reference frame t prime. So if we replace the t in these x prime, y prime, and z prime equations with t prime, we'll be able to find the velocity components of p in the primed reference frame. In order to do that, we will isolate the t and put it in terms of t prime in the t prime equation. And when we do that, this is what we will get. If we now plug in this t into the x prime, y prime, and z prime equations, this is what we will end up with. Of course, we'll cancel the gammas in the x prime equations, and then in order to end up with our velocities, ux prime, uy prime, uz prime, we will divide all these three equations by t prime. And when we do that, we get our prime velocity components in terms of the unprime velocity components. Once again, note that gamma is calculated in terms of the relative velocity of the reference frame. So gamma is the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. It has the v, it doesn't have the u. The v is the velocity of r prime relative to r.
So these three equations represent the Lorentz transformation of velocity components. So essentially the transformation of velocity components when you go, when you have a particle and you go from one inertial reference frame to another inertial reference frame. One thing you'll notice from these equations is that the velocity component ux prime in the x direction or x prime direction since they're both the same direction, this x component of velocity is parallel to the relative motion of the reference frames which is given by the velocity v. Remember that if we go up, r prime is traveling at a velocity v in the x direction relative to r. So therefore ux prime and ux are parallel to v and this is why they are called parallel components. In contrast, the y and z components of velocity are perpendicular components. Now the transformation equation of the parallel components is different from that of the perpendicular components, which you may have already noticed if you look at these boxed equations that represent the Lorentz transformation of velocity. So in general, we can say that the parallel components, which I'll denote using this u with the parallel subscript, transform via this equation, while the perpendicular components all transform via this equation. Once again, this gamma is given by the following equation. Now, an important thing to note from these parallel and perpendicular equations is that the faster r prime is traveling relative to r, the more compressed the particle's perpendicular velocity components appear in r prime. So instead of looking like this in the base frame r, the particle looks as though it's traveling in this direction. Let's now do a quick example problem involving this velocity transformation with a simple special relativity question on relative velocity. Suppose I have two trains, one I'll call A and the other I'll call B. Both trains are traveling at a velocity of 0.6c towards each other, except A is going in the positive direction and B is going in the negative direction. And of course c is again the speed of light. Now if these 0.6c's are velocities relative to the ground, what is the velocity of the train A relative to B? Now if I were to use the classical mechanics techniques, I would simply say that the velocity of A relative to B is the velocity of A minus the velocity of B, which would come out to 1.2c. However, in special relativity this is not possible. The speed of light is constant in all inertial reference frames. It is not possible for an observer in train B to perceive an inertial reference frame traveling faster than light. This is where the velocity transformation equations come in. Let's write them down or copy paste them over here. Now I can ignore the y and z equations since everything is going on in the x direction, so I will just cross those out. I also don't need the gamma because it's not part of the ux prime equation. All that's left to do is set up my reference frames and plug everything into this equation. I'll assume my unprimed reference frame is r, which is just the stationary reference frame corresponding to the ground. Ideally, for these relative velocity problems, you want one of your reference frames to be stationary because it makes things easier. This is especially necessary because the 0.6c's represent the velocity relative to the ground. Now, since I want to calculate the velocity of A relative to B, I'll make my other reference frame R prime the reference frame of an observer in train B. I want to find everything relative to B, so I should probably make one of my reference frames match up with train B. So that means relative to the reference frame r, the velocity of r prime is v equals negative 0.6c. That's what the v means after all. It's the velocity of the r prime reference frame relative to the r reference frame. Meanwhile, the velocity ux of a particle, which in this case is my train a, relative to the reference frame r is 0.6c. And this is all I need for my relative velocity equation in special relativity. The velocity component ux prime, which is the velocity of A relative to the reference frame r prime, so relative to train B, is then given by this transformation equation. If I plug in the numbers, this is what I get. The numerator is just 1.2c, while negative 0.6 times 0.6 is negative 0.36c, and the negative of the negative of 0.36 is just positive 0.36, and so if we simplify everything in the end, we get 1.2 over 1.36c, which approximately comes down to 0.8824c. And this, of course, is less than the relative velocity we got from simple classical mechanics, and it's also less than the speed of light, so it makes sense in the context of special relativity. So the take-home message is that we can use these velocity transformation equations to transform velocity components between inertial reference frames 
and also determine relative velocities and special relativity without violating any rules because we went above the speed of light. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.